on another big project. He did think it might be fun to play the ghost of Christmas yet to come, since the character had no lines and just pointed a lot. But Mrs. Wagner said she wanted someone tall in the part, which Johnny definitely wasn't. He was mentally rele relegating himself to being a nondescript townsperson or working on the sets or, and costumes when Wilson walked onto the stage holding a script. I want to read for Scrooge, he growled. Stifled snickers echoed through the cafeteria. Mrs. Wagner nodded and Wilson began reading. This should be good, Johnny thought sarcastically. But it wasn't good. It was great. Wilson all but transformed before everyone's eyes. His face scowled, his body bent, his voice became even more sneery than usual. What is Christmas but a time for spending money one doesn't have, he intoned, for finding oneself a year older but not a, an hour richer, a time for balancing books filled with dead deadbeats who'll beg and cry and whimper for more time to pay what they owe. Humbug on Christmas, I say. If I had my way, every fool who'd spout, spouted Merry Christmas would be boiled alive in eggnog and stabbed with a branch of holly through his heart. When he finished, everyone sat in, a, in stunned silence. Mrs. Wagner smiled and said, Well done, Mr. Knox. Thank you. Wilson looked around the room, snorted, and exited the stage. Suddenly, Johnny really wanted the part of Ebenezer Scrooge. Is there any, is there anyone else who would like to read? Mrs. Wagner called. Johnny jumped up, picked up a script, and made his way to the stage. Mrs. Wagner peered up at him. Mr. Whitaker? I'm reading for Scrooge, too. The teacher nodded, and the room went silent again. Johnny thump thumbed through the pages and quickly found the section he wanted. He took, the, he took a moment to scan the lines, then launched into the scene. Nonsense! He bum barked in a voice even sneerer than Wilson's, and the audience jumped. That was nothing, nothing at all. Just some remains of an underwhelming. Supper f from a rather greasy pub. He rubbed his belly and scowled. A bit of undigested beef. He blurped. He burped. The kids laughed. Or a crumb of moldy cheese. He held his nose and fanned his face with the script. Another laugh. Jacob Marley. Puh! Whatever it was, there's more of gravy in it than of grave. He squelched another burp, bulging his cheeks out and bunging his eyes out like Harpo, Harpo Marx. The room roared with laughter. He dropped the script, moved to the footlights and peered out of the the crawl through squinted eyes. There's no more of Jacob Marley in my door knocker than Father Christmas himself within my chimney. Humbug on the loose imaginations and the bedlam they cause. Humbug, I say! He huffed and turned his back to them. There was a pause, and then the room erupted in applause and cheers. Mrs. Wagner smiled from ear to ear. She motioned for the applause to cease and said, That was excellent, Mr. Whitaker. Johnny smiled and nodded. Retrieving the script and left the stage, Mrs. Wagner turned to the crowd. Is there anyone else? 
but it seemed no one wanted to follow Johnny. Mrs. Wagner took a deep breath and said, Thank you all. A truly fine job by everyone. I shall post the cast list at the end of the day. Johnny placed the script back on the table. Excuse me. He noticed Wilson glaring at him. He smiled and it felt good. In fact, it was the first time he'd felt this good in quite a while. And it lasted almost five minutes. That's when Emmy confronted him in the hallway. What was that? He ex she explained. You can act too? I thought you weren't even interested in being in the play. Johnny shrugged. I changed my mind. Because of Wilson? No! He s simpered. He, she glared at him. Well, maybe a little. Emmy scoffed and rolled her eyes. You really do love being the center of attention, don't you? She turned and walked away. Hey, there's no guarantee I'm going to get the part. He called after her. But when the cast list was posted, he saw that he had won the role of Scrooge. And even better, Wilson was cast as his understudy. Wilson steamed when he saw the list but said nothing. Artie was tagged to be the go ghost of Jacob Marley. The ghost of Christmas yet to come went to none other than that goon, Laszlo. Which made sense, as he stood head and shoulders over all the other students. Emmy was cast as Belle, Scrooge's love interest, which made Johnny rather uncomfortable. He recalled from the story that Scrooge and Belle held hands, but didn't remember if things got any mushier. He doubted whether Mrs. Wagner would let it go any further than that. At least, he hoped she wouldn't. The play was set for December 22nd, plenty of time to practice and get the sets built and costumes put together. Johnny was thankful for the distractions of the day and the festive feelings he evoked, though they only lasted a little while. In the back of his mind, behind his throbbing eye, he couldn't help thinking about who took the healing cloth and how he was going to get it back, not to mention the new school bully and the shiner he, he'd need to explain to his folks. Chapter 4 Mommy, Daddy, Johnny Scott, I looks like a fat raccoon. He'd been hoping his folks wouldn't notice his father because he was reading his newspaper and Fiona because, well, she couldn't. <laughs> but he'd forgotten about Charlie, who brought up his black eye the minute he walked in the door. Of course, sisters, he thought. You've been fighting, Harold stated. Here comes trouble, Johnny thought. Not really. Johnny rebutted. Unless you call someone hitting you and you falling down a fight. Fiona panicked. Can you see? Can you see all right? Lord, please don't let him lose his sight. Harold quickly calmed her down. It's a black eye, Fiona. Boys get them every day. He turns to Johnny and pointed, pointedly raised his eyebrows. But I don't want you fighting, understood? Johnny understood. Harold hadn't heard about 
His other fights, thanks to Fiona, who had always covered up for him. Now, here she was, frightened at the mere thought of an eye injury. He was determined to keep her from worrying about it again. He also decided to keep quiet about the school play for now. Telling Fiona he had gotten the lead in a play she could not she could not see might add to her misery. At bedtime, Harold brought Johnny some ice. That's quite a shiner. A faint smile crept onto his face. I guess those karate lessons didn't work out so well, huh? Johnny gingerly placed the ice the bag of ice on his eye. I didn't even have time to defend myself. Honest, Dad. I didn't start the fight. This kid had it in for me. I'm sorry it scared Fiona so much. Oh. And speaking of that, there's something else I... You need to know. He told his father about being cast as Ebenezer Scrooge. Harold shook his head in wonder. You know... Sometimes I'm amazed at how much happens to you in a single day. Johnny smiled and shrugged. Harold thought, looked thoughtful and then said, First of all, congratulations on getting the lead in the play. And you were right not to mention it. I'll tell your mother when the time is most opportune. As for this new kid, well, hang in there. Oftentimes, bullies are the very ones who become your best friends. The next day began with Macduff licking Johnny's face, his tail wagging happily. Johnny managed to smile and then grimace because his eye still hurt. He scratched dolefully behind Macduff's ear. Macduff jumped off the bed and pattered over to the door, waiting for Johnny to let him out. Johnny complied and then shivered. His room was freezing. He walked over to check the forecast from his biometer. Though the morning sky was clear, the biometer indicated that more snow was on the way. Interesting, he muttered to the device. We'll see how right you are. He set the biometer on his windowsill and headed to the bathroom where he washed up and combed his t t tussled hair. And then he went back to his room, put on his white button-up shirt, plain knee socks, and long knickers, and sneakers, in that order, and plodded down the stairway. The family was at the table. Charlie was already halfway through her bowl of oatmeal. Her prunes sat undisturbed. Harold had his face buried in some in the morning's paper. Fiona was a few bites into a piece of buttered toast and sipping her morning forger's coffee. Good morning, John Avery, she said with a forced lit. Have a seat. I'll get your oatmeal. I can do it, he responded. Nonsense, lads. It. She said, standing up, a twinge of acerbic bite sharpened the tone in her voice. He'd never heard her speak so abrasively before. She walked five steps, obviously predetermined, then reached out to the big pot on the stove. Johnny looked over to his father. The newspaper in his hands didn't move, but his eyes did. He watched closely as Fiona found her way to the oatmeal, carefully ladled a portion of it into the bowl, and took five steps back to the table. She held the bowl out to where Johnny sat. Here you go. Eat up. Weariness covered her face like war paint. Johnny accepted the bowl. Oh, 
I meant to tell you. Emmy and her folks said that if you ever need anything, they're ready to help. Fiona stiffened. Well, that's very nice of them, but I think we'll manage like we always do. It's just... He looked at his father, who gave no indication what he thought of the information, and then at Charlie, who was trying to hide her prunes in the unmeaten remains of her oatmeal. With all that's happened, it might be easier if... Fiona sat down. I don't hear you chewing yet, she said tersely. That food isn't going to jump into your mouth you know, eat John. Since the day Fiona had joined their family, she always refrained to referred to him affectionately as John Avery, leaving his middle name out felt to him like de definitive pause in her affection. Johnny didn't know whether to feel hurt or concerned, but he felt, but he knew, one thing, the look his father shot him at that very moment meant, eat your breakfast and be quiet. Johnny ate his breakfast. Mrs. Wagner stood beside the chalkboard in front of the stage. This morning, we will concentrate on sets and costumes. This afternoon, on rehearsal, there will... There will be no recess today. We need to use every minute on the production. As the bard... As the bard, William Shakespeare, would say, the play's the thing. On this chalkboard, you will see the breakdown of responsibilities for every one of you. Wilson scanned the board. Why am I assigned to costumes? I should be building stuff. I've assigned each of you according to your particular skill set. You, Mr. Knox are not a skilled builder or of stuff. Johnny and enemy scammed the board. When they found their names, they broke out into huge grins. As the rest of the students began their task, they approached the teacher. Excuse me, Mrs. Wagner? Excuse me, Mrs. Wagner? Yes, Mr. Whitaker? You have Emmy and me down to work with Ben Huck. That's correct. The teacher nodded. He's making some electrical devices for the performance, and he requested that you two assist him. He said you have a propensity for electronics. Me? Emmy explained, and Johnny quickly frowned at her. She got the hint. Me! Oh, my! That's nice of him! I'm glad you approve, Miss Capello. Now off you go. Yes, ma'am. Johnny and Emmy raced out of the cafeteria and downstairs to Ben's custodial custodial room. They found Ben sitting on a stool reading 42 Years in the White House by Irvin Hood Hoover. Seeing them enter, he smiled, bent down the corner of the page where he'd left off, and closed the book. My new assistants come in. Reporting for duty, sir, Johnny said with a salute. Johnny's Lo Johnny loved Ben's room. The tools, the gadgets, the workbench, even the clutter somehow made him feel right at home. So Mrs. Wagner wants some electrical devices for the play, huh? Ben nodded. 
Yup, we can't use candles or fire on stage. So we got to come up with electrical devices that flicker like fly fire. She also wants us to make some lighting, lightning effects for when the Christmas ghosts appear and take on, take Scrooge on his journey. Johnny nodded. Sounds simple enough. He noted, he noticed a table cluttered with wiring, a metal box, an electrical switch, a pile of rags, and several large speaker horns. Johnny nodded at the mess. Are those our supplies? Ben glanced at, at it. Nah, that's a different project. Fire alarm system for school. Amy's eyes widened. Why? Is the building dangerous? Nah, just keep, just being cautious. Mind if I take a look? Johnny asked. Ben waved them on. Help yourself. Johnny and Emmy moved to the table and Ben fo followed, pointing out the items in the system. It's pretty basic. Them's the speakers. This here is the control box. The speakers are wired to, to it. The box has electrical circuit and a and a buzz, buzzer built in. Electrical runs through the circuit, which keeps the buzzer from buzzing. Pull the switch, the circuit's broke. The buzz begins. Let me show you. He pulled the control box into an, an out, outlet and flipped the switch. Instantly, a loud buzz filled the room. Emmy put her hands over her ears. That's annoying! She explained over the din. Imagine how... Imagine it going through these big speakers. Ben hollered, switching it off. Johnny examined the control box. It's a lot like how the class bell works, right? Ben nodded. Pretty much. But with spikers instead of bells. Still, needs a mat more work but when it's done if there, there's a fire and someone throws the switch it'll be for sure to get everyone's attention it'd be great if it could alert the fire station too Johnny muttered thoughtfully come again Oh, I was just thinking if when you pulled the switch, it not only buzzed to the speakers, but also sent a signal to the fire station. That way they'd arrive quick quicker. Ben's eyes lit up. Smart idea. There's only one problem, Emmy interjected. Providence doesn't have a fire station. Johnny cocked his head to one side. Well, yeah. There's that. Emmy looked thoughtful, then added, May, but maybe we could use the speakers as a sort of sound system for the play. Sound system? Asked Ben. You know, hook them up to, the, to microphones next to the stage so everyone in the room could hear the lines better. We could even use them for music and nifty sound effect sounds for the Christmas ghosts. That's a great idea, Emmy, Johnny explained. Show sure is. I knew you'd be a big help on this project, Emmy grinned. So, what do we do first? They spent the next hour or so drawing up plans. Ben taught Emmy how to use the soldering gun. They worked up a small assembly line of sorts. 
As they settled into their routine, Emmy asked, So, how was your trip to visit your mother, Ben? Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Very nice, thank you. I miss having Mama around. She lives in Mississippi, Johnny asked. Ben nodded. Toplo. She's made for a family there. Been with them since she was 16. They lived here in Providence for the longest time until they inherited an estate. I tried coaxing Mama to stay, but she's fiercely loyal. Couldn't imagine leaving the family she's been working for for so long. They wouldn't know which end was up, she said. Emmy soldered a connection and waved away a wisp of smoke. But your father doesn't live there, does he? But her father... But your father doesn't live there, does he? No. Daddy can't stay in one place too long. He lingers for a spell, then goes off gallivanting again. Ben shook his head. Mama don't complain, though. Not that she ever would. Mothers go through a lot, Johnny said quietly. Ben laid his hand on Johnny's shoulders. shoulder. From what I hear, Fiona's a strong woman, too. She walk in a rough road, for sure. But she'll make it through. Y'all will. John nodded appreciate, appreciatively. How have you been feel? How have you been feeling since the day at the still? Good as ever. Ben answered, maybe even better. You still have no idea where the blood on your shirt... You still have no idea where the blood on your shirt came from? Emmy asked. Ben looked perplexed. Not a clue. Don't remember anything, any much of anything from that day. Maybe I'd been hunting. I do go out once or twice a month. But if and I did shoot something, I got no idea where I left it. It sure ain't in my, it sure ain't back home in my icebox. He shrugged as he kept working. You know, back in the French and Indian War, I, in one battle, George Washington was singled out by the Indians. They were good shots. Rarely missed. His coat was sh shot through four times and two horses he was riding was killed. But old George never even got a nick in him. Ben nodded his head in admiration. Who knows? Maybe I'm like old George. Even if the, even if the bullet did miss you, that doesn't explain the blood. Emmy said, I don't know what to tell you. It's a mystery. I'm glad I wasn't shot, though. Daddy wouldn't ever forgive himself. I'm glad, too, Emmy said, even if I can't make any sense of it. You know, my mama used to say that common sense only takes you so far. Beyond that, you gotta walk in faith. He looked hard into Johnny's eyes. That's good advice for all of us. Johnny smiled. Perf... Perfunctorily. Perfunctorily. He didn't think Faith had ever done him any favors. Sometimes life seemed like one big punch in the face. Speaking of which... Have you ever met that big oaf, Laszlo Farmsworth, yet? One of Ben's eyebrows shot up like a gopher popping its head out of a hole. Yeah, I've had the pleasure. Word is that the folks couldn't take care of him no more because his father's been without work 
so he came to live with his uncle on a farm outside of town. This depression is still biting hard. The kid's as stout as a bull. Johnny snorted. That where you got that black eye? Ben asked. Johnny grimaced and nodded. He snuck up on me. Ben's head bobbed as he laughed. Can't imagine a boy that size sneaking anywhere. The uncle thinks he has a shot at playing football for Duke. Emmy said. All that Artie saw that he's not the big bully in town anymore. Artie ought to... Artie ought to be glad. Maybe he'll get his life ironed out a bit. I wouldn't hold my breath. Johnny said sourly. Never do. He responded. You two sneer clear of, you two steer clear of Farn's birth. That black eyes an inner junk introduction. He'll be happy to give you an encore and more. Now let's get the rest of these electrical candles, Moon. They finished the, m the morning with Ben, then spent the afternoon rehearsing. During the blocking of Johnny's scene with the ghost of Christmas yet to come, Laszlo used every opportunity to bump, poke, elbow, and shove Johnny when Mrs. Wagner wasn't looking. Johnny was sure he'd be black and blue by the end of rehearsal. How was he supposed to avoid the goon when they were playing in a play together? Chapter 5 When he got out when he got home after when he got home that afternoon, it was still light outside. So Johnny decided to have a little fun and roam around in the snow for a while. I'll be in the backyard, he called. Take your sister with you, Harold called. Johnny cringed. So much for fun. Fortunately, Charlie said, I don't want to go outside. It's too cold. I want to play with my dolls. I'll take the dog instead. I'll take... Yeah, Johnny noted. Come on, Macduff. Boy and dog bolted through the door before another word could be said. The air felt invigorating. Johnny bent down and packed a baseball-sized snowball. Then he imagined himself as a pitcher with the majors starting, starting down Babe Ruth. Staring down Babe Ruth, he leaned forward, shook his head, shook it again then nodded straight up and let it fly. The great Bamberino had been at the plate. He would have taken it in the ear. Johnny frowned, but packed it together another snowball for his second pitch. This one flew over home plate and left the slugger fan the wind, fanning the wind. Johnny smiled smugly. At third base, Macduff barked. Johnny looked over. The mutt was sniffing and yapping beside the shed. Johnny called time out and walked over for a confer conference, conference with his canine coach. As he approached the shed, he froze in his tracks. A set of footprints in the snow led from the woods behind their house to the shed door. Nobody had been by in days other than Emmy, and her footprints came from her house, which was in the opposite direction. Anyways, anyway, these prints were made by Baker a much bigger shoe than she wore. Perhaps Johnny's father had been outside? 
not likely. When he wasn't helping Fiona, Harold spent the remainder of his time in his study. Johnny examined the prints. They made the same pattern as his galoshes, only several inches bigger, but they didn't look much deeper than his tracks. The person who made them was either a skinny adult or a kid with exceptionally large feet. Determining the path the footprints took was a challenge since they walked over themselves in places. Whoever made those tracks had to have done it after the snow ended a few days ago. If the goal had been to find the cloth, the person was, as the saying goes, a day late and a dollar short. More likely, though, it was a hobo looking for shelter from the cold. Johnny opened the door wide enough to let light in. Macduff dashed in front of him, sniffing and snorting, sniffing and snorting the scents left by the trespasser. Perhaps Macduff could sniff out a clue. Johnny scanned about. Nothing looked out of order. That was a problem. The shed always looked out of order. Fiona pleaded over and over for Harold to clean the shed, and, sh and he always answered, It's a shed. It's supposed to be messy. Plus, Johnny and his father had fairly ransacked the place when they searched for cloth. It wasn't especially tidy now. It, but things had been picked up and moved about. That suggested to Johnny that someone who needed shelter had reorganized things enough to make room for him or herself. Macduff wheeled around in a circle several times. Beside Johnny's bike, expecting the hound to discover something important, Johnny eagerly watched. Instead, the dog lay down in, in a tight ball and shut its eyes for a nap. So much for being on the case, Johnny thought. On a whim, Johnny rummaged around again for the cloth. Fresh eyes may find things that were missed in a rush of adrenaline. He cinematically, systematically worked his way through the shed, constantly having to step over Macduff, who obstinately refused to budge. At one point, a glimpse of white caught Johnny's eye, but it turned out to be just a bit of snow that had drifted in. Finding nothing, Johnny called for Macduff. Let's go, boy. The terrier jumped up and pranced outside. Johnny stopped. Something caught his eye. A folded piece of paper was stuck underneath the wheel of his bike, where Macduff, Macduff had laid. Johnny picked up the paper and read it. Ingredients. Ingredients. One berry, jumper cable, rags, lightning. Go back like Thomas Edison said, try, try again. Strange. Although it had been written from Johnny's perspective, no one knew him would believe he had written it. He won, he won most of the class spelling bees, and he would never attribute an errand quote to anyone, especially Thomas Edison one of his heroes. He was convinced he knew who had written the note though. The boy he saw by the water tower when he first moved to town. 
This would be the third mysterious note the boy had penned. And Johnny still didn't know who he was. After reading it again, Johnny was certain it was suggesting he look again for the healing cloth. But how would the boy know where the cloth was unless he took it? And if he did take it, why not simply return it instead of leaving a cryptic note? Johnny had no re- Johnny did re reason one thing. The place he needed to go back to had had to be the water tower. That was where the experiment had taken place and where he'd seen the mysterious boy. Johnny ex exited the shed. It was getting toward evening and darkness was falling rapidly. He peered through the window into the house. His parents and Charlie sat at the dining room table. They hadn't started making supper yet. If he slipped away quickly, he could, he could be back before they even knew he left. What do you think, Macduff? He gave, the dog gave him a puzzled whine. He was just about to take off when he heard the phone ring. He saw Harold rise to answer it. Johnny went to the back door and crept inside with Macduff. As he moved slow, slowly toward the dining room, Harold's side of the conversation became clearer. Yes, his father said solemn, 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 solemnly. Yes, doctor, I'm familiar with that. Are you certain? I understand. Thank you for getting back to us so quickly. Goodbye. He hung up the phone. There was a long moment of silence. Then Fiona said, Out with, out with it, Harold. No beating around the bush. Harold took a deep breath. That was the doctor in relay. Johnny took a. Johnny thought his father sound, sounded ancient, hollow. Harold continued. The test results are back. He wanted to call and say. They, aren't. He sighed. Tears welled up in his eyes. There's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do? Fiona said. He's there. Harold's head dropped, drooped. No. Fiona sat. S so... So Callie, so Clee, so Clee, barely moving a muscle. After a moment, she took a deep breath and said, "So that's it then. I truly am blind." She let out a muffled sob. Harold rushed to her side. I'm so sorry, sweetheart. He sat, the tears running down his cheeks. He took her hand and grabbed it with, and she grabbed it with both of hers. Charlie sat on the other end of the table, wide-eyed, silent, large tears trickling down her face as well. Johnny entered the room, picked Charlie up, set her in her mother's lap, and gave his stepmother the warmest, tightest embrace he could. His face, his own face, wet with sorrow. Harold wrap, wrapped his family in his arms, and for a long while they all wept together. 
The biometer was accurate. The night did bring more snow. Johnny slept very little. Instead, he sat in his desk chair and through his bedroom window watched the flakes drift softly and silently to the ground. Is life as aimless as those snowflakes? He wondered. He'd might he'd been taught that there was a purpose in everything, that God was all knowing and all powerful. But if that were true, how could God let Fiona go blind? Perhaps instead life was just a series of daily occurrences and hap 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 happen stints happenstance. And if it was, even if he did find the healing cloth, could it reverse things? Would it? Johnny looked down at Macduff sleeping on the floor beside his chair. It had for a dog. It had for Ben Huck. But it hadn't for Steve. Why? Johnny had no answer. He wasn't even sure if there was. An answer. But he knew one thing. He had to at least find the cloth and try. At first, like he rose from his chair and shook Macduff awake. Come on, boy. We have an errand to run before school. One I hope will make this a really nice Christmas for everyone. Johnny dressed quickly and he and Macduff slipped downstairs and out the door. They ran to the tower which wasn't easy to, to do through the mounting layers of fresh snow. Johnny worried that even if the cloth was there it would be impossible to find. As soon as they arrived, they tried to get Mc... he tried to get Macduff to sniff out the cloth, but it was but the clueless dog responded to his command with doe-eyed confusion. After a few minutes of rooting around, Johnny found the wires leading down from the tower. His he traced them to where they would terminate the battery and he soon found the spot. The battery, though, was gone. He scratched away the snow in, the, in a five-foot radius, assuming that if the mysterious boy had deposited the cloth here, he would have placed it close to where the battery would have been. Nothing. Johnny then walked along the fence line bordering Granville House in case the wind had caught the cloth. Again, nothing. He, he even got desperate and looked inside Granville House and down by where the still had been. But as before, he found nothing. How could I have been so stupid? He muttered. That note had to have been in the shed since Tuesday. Why didn't I check it? He sighed. On the other hand, why would I have checked it? He growled. Kicked a small clump of snow savagely. Hailed Macduff and ran back home, slipping the entire way. He hoped to get home before the rest of the family awoke. He debated whether to tell his father about the note and decided he would not. But when he walked in the front door, he saw everyone sitting at the table, Harold giving him the look. He changed his mind. Sharing the note might be a good idea after all. Where were you? Harold Harold said in that deadly calm tone of his, just taking a walk, trying to clear my mind. 
You should nay go. You should nay go off without telling anyone where you've been gone, John Avery, Fiona said. No, you shouldn't, Harold agreed. His eyes burned with anger. Charlie piped up. Johnny's in trouble again? She sang softly. All right, all right, Charlie. Fiona ch chide. That's enough. Charlie looked down at her eggs, and Johnny used that moment to mouth to Harold, I need to talk to you. Complete with over re renunciation and a sm and small ha hand gestures Harold's expression changed his eyes narrowed and he nodded slightly I'm sorry if I worried you Johnny said I just needed some air I understand Fiona replied she reached out and found her husband's arm. Boys will be boys. Eh, Arnold? Arnold patted her hand and said, Some boys are more than others. But I still want to talk to you, young man. He pointed. My office. Now. Yes, sir. Johnny responded. The two made their way down the hallway to the inner sanctum. Don't be so hard on him, Har Ar Arnold. Harold, Harold. Fiona called out. We've had enough harshness in this house of late. Behind closed doors, Johnny showed his father the note and told him all that had happened. Harold frowned. I can't help thinking that if you had just brought this cloth to me in the first place, we could have avoided this mess. A wave of resentment arose in Johnny, and he almost retorted, but stopped himself. He had dodged one bullet that morning, no sense in standing in front of another one. Harold continued, There's still a chance that it could be in there somewhere, under the snow. It's possible, Johnny said with a hint of frustration. But I looked everywhere. That made sense to me. Harold stroked his chin. I need to go to, I need to go into town this afternoon to get a prescription for Fiona. Meet me at the water tower after school and we'll look again. If it is there, we'll find it. Johnny nodded. Dad, do you think Professor Mangle might have taken the cloth? He doesn't live far from the water tower. He might have seen it there. Harold gazed up at the ceiling thoughtfully. To be honest, I wondered that myself. You did? Carl has a vested interest in finding this cloth. He could use it on Steve, for one. He's also quite ambitious, and I'm pretty sure he suspects we have it because of the journal. Johnny took a deep breath. The day we went to the hospital to see Steve, I took the cloth with me. Harold quickly turned his gaze to Johnny. His eyes were wide in surprise. And? I put it on him. It didn't do anything. Johnny shrugged. Obviously. 
Harold pondered for a time. And the two stood in silence. Johnny walked to the bay window and flocked the flocked tree limbs of the massive oak in their backyard swayed gently in the wind. Two squirrels scampered under the branches, foraging for food. The scene reminded Johnny of a picture postcard he saw at the Worldworths store on Main Street in Durham. Harold perched on his desk, tapping nervously on on his fingers with a pencil. Perhaps I'll have a little chat with Carl. The idea struck Johnny as odd. But what would you say? Did you steal a cloth from my shed? Harold snorted. I have no idea what I'd, I'd say. That wouldn't insult him. He'll be offended if the accusation isn't true. Maybe even more so if it is. An idea crept into Johnny's mind. How about if I go visit Steve? I'd like to check on him anyway. And if Professor Mangle has the cloth and tried to use it, Steve would say something. Especially since I tried the cloth on him before. Harold mulled the idea over. We have nothing to lose, I suppose. And about everything, and above everything, Steve is your friend. And it would be good to visit him. He finally nodded. Fine. We'll check the water tower af this afternoon. If we don't find the cloth there, I'll drive you to the hospital. Chapter 5 The school day crept by. Johnny was so distracted with thoughts of the cloth that he couldn't concentrate, much to the consternation of Mrs. Wagner, Emmy, and Ben, and to the delight of Laszlo and Wilson. As soon as school was dismissed, Johnny told Emmy he wouldn't be able to walk her walk home with her and raced out the school doors making a beeline for the water tower howard was there waiting for him and a few garden tools in hand to help with the job harold used the shovel while johnny used a garden rake after more than an hour of arduous Searching in the snow, they reluctantly decided the cloth was simply not there. Let me see the note again, Harold said. Johnny pulled it from his pocket and handed it to his father. Harold read it slowly, seeming to digest every word. I don't know, John. It could just mean to try your experiment again. Sure, but why leave a note to say that? And why would the word rags be underlined? And why would someone put this note in the shed after the cloth disappeared? It wasn't there when we rummaged through the shed before. Fair questions. He handed the note back to Johnny. So I guess I'm going to the So I guess I'm going to the hospital to visit Steve. Har Harold shook his head. You won't have to. Carl called the house earlier. Steve was released from the hospital yesterday. Carl said you could stop by the house tomorrow for a visit. If Steve is was well enough to go home. Maybe Professor Mangle did use the cloth on him. I don't think so, Harold said. Carl told me that Steve hadn't completely recovered. 
which is why he didn't want any company yet today. That doesn't mean Professor Mangle didn't take the cloth. Johnny moved, mused. I tried it on Steve and it didn't work. Professor Mangle may have done the same. We can't, we can't concentrate ourselves with mites and maybes. Harold responded, hopefully we'll get some answers tomorrow. The ride, for, the ride home was quiet. Both of them lost in thought. When they pulled up to the house, they were met with surprise. An unfamiliar woman stood at the, the front door. She held a rather large box and a basket covered with a towel. Johnny and his father exited the car and walked up to the porch. The woman turned to them. Howdy! She said. She looked to be in her mid-thirties and wore a pink cotton floral dress under a heavy wool coat. She had dark brown hair, shoulder length, and a triangular nose, and she smiled the way a dog might after it chewed up your slippers. Johnny detected an assortment of tantalizing aromas wafting from both basket and box. May I help you? Harold said. I'm Ari. I work down at Hoop Steiner. I I've been knocking at your door here, but nobody's answering. Thought I might, though I can hear talking inside. Harold moved to the door. Uh, yes, my wife. She's no need for for splaining. Can I come in? She asked. Of course, Harold replied. Just let me, Fiona called from inside. Harold? She sounds panicked, Johnny thought. Harold opened the door and entered. Ari and Johnny followed. Fiona stood still as a statue next to the dining room table. Charlie peered around the kitchen door shyly. Harold moved to his wife. It's all right, Fiona. Harold, I tried to answer, but I got turned around and I couldn't, I couldn't. Sorry, I scared you, dearie. Ari said sympathetically. Didn't mean no harm. Thomas down at the diner sent me over with a mess of vittles for you. He said the cook got carried away and he'd rather it go to good use. Where can I set it? Johnny could read his father's face like a newspaper. The headline, this family is not a charity case. This was followed by the opposing argument, but I cannot offend by refusing a thoughtful gesture. Harold reached for the box. I'll take it, thank you. No need to thank me. I'm just doing what the boss told me to. It's very kind of him. Harold nodded, setting the box on the table. We, we appreciate it. John, take the basket. <laughs> Johnny removed... Remove his hat and took the basket from Ari's arm. Thank you, young man. You remind me of my brother. Same eyes as you. And his hair was curly when he was young, too. Turned straight when he was older. Strangest thing. That happened... That happened to me as well, Fiona said. She was trying to sound casual, but Johnny thought... It came across as force. Though, though I wish, though I wish I'd have, have been able to keep my curl, 
She smiled weakly and dropped her hands to her sides. Fiona, this is Ari, Harold said, moving to her side. She works at the diner. I'm not deaf, Harold. I heard her. Stretching out her hand, she said, Nice to meet you, Ari. Act. You've brought food. It's not necessary. I'm quite capa capable. It's no trouble at all. Ari interrupted, taking Fiona's hand. Folks, folks have heard of your plot. It's a sour state if we don't have heft part of the load when a neighbor hits hard times. Fiona forced another smile. Tell ye what, tell ye what, if you'd like to join us, I'll take this to the kitchen and make us up some plates. She reached out of the out for the box, but Harold had set it precariously on the table's edge. All it took was the slight bump of Fiona's searching hand, and before Harold could could catch it, the box toppled to the floor with a loud crash. Food splattered on the rug, the chairs, and the wall. Fiona stiffened. No one said anything a long moment. Finally, Ari said, Don't worry. Now don't worry about that. I'll have that cleaned up in no time. That's not necessary. Harold said, oh, We'll get it. Johnny added, Meh! Everyone stopped to look at Fiona with A quivering voice, she said, Thank ye for stopping by, Ari, and for bringing the food. And be sure to thank Thomas as well. Ari looked from Harold to Johnny, then smiled, taking the hint. Sure thing, darling. She turned to leave. Y'all have a blessed day. See ya when the sun starts shining. Again, she walked out the door and closed it behind her. She was so nice, Charlie squeaked. Harold, Fiona said. So, Callie? So, Callie? Take me to my room, please. Harold took her hand and led her upstairs. Johnny heard her crying the whole way. Chapter 6 Saturday morning dawned bright and sunny after rising from a fitful night's sleep during which he heard Fiona crying. Johnny got dressed and went downstairs to breakfast. The family ate in silence and this time Fiona let Johnny get his own food. Once he had finished, he washed and dried his dishes, and then, I'm going to go visit Steve now, if that's okay. Fiona said nothing, just down a long sip of coffee. Harold nodded. Just, just keep watch on the time. Johnny donned his coat and hat and slipped his... Galoshes the, and opening the front door looked back at the table. Doleful air hung slowly, sullenly over his family. Johnny sighed, stepped outside, and closed the door behind him. Twenty minutes later, he knocked on the Mangles' front door which was eventually answered by Mrs. Mangle in a few in the few times 
Johnny had interacted with her, he'd never seen the least hint of a smile on her face. She strayed true to form. In spite of Steve's return home, she seemed as cheerless as ever. Steve's in his room, down the hall on the left, she rasped. Johnny got to Steve's room just as Paul was leaving. Hey, John said. Paul didn't respond with anything more than a frown. He walked straight past Johnny and grabbed a coat and went outside. Odd, Johnny thought, but Paul always did seem a bit wacky. He shrugged and went into the bedroom. Steve sat in an overstuffed chair, a white metal Spartan table in front of him. He held a pen and seemed to be doodling with it. Then Johnny got close enough to see that much much more than doodling it was. A rather impressive work of art. A drawing of a small boy sitting in front of a fireplace and beside an ornate Christmas tree. I heard you like to draw, but I didn't realize you were this good, Johnny said, bending over to admire Steve's work. Thanks, Steve said, adding some shading. I've drawn several sketches. I want to make them into Christmas cards and try selling them to pay for some of my medical bills I'm piling up. That's a great idea. I'm sure lots of people would buy them. But how are you going to sell them? Not sure yet. Steve answered, his pen still active. Maybe Paul can peddle them door to door. Worthy cause and all that stuff. Johnny sat on the edge of Steve's bed. I could help, and I'm sure Emmy would too. How many are you going to make? Dad went to the newspaper in Durham, and they offered to print as many as we wanted for free. So I don't know, a bunch, I guess. Well, count me in. Only if you pay a percentage. Say, 50%? Johnny laughed. You make a terrible businessman. Pay me whatever you want. I'm just going to give it back to you to help with your expenses anyway. Sounds like you'd make a terrible businessman, too, Steve rejoined. I'm sure I would, <laughs> Johnny agreed. That's all right. I'm... Being a businessman sounds pretty boring anyway. I want to be an explorer. Steve nodded, but still hadn't made eye contact. After an awkward pause, Johnny said, I'm really glad they let you come home. I was worried you might be in the hospital a lot longer. Thanks. Steve said, Sexicantly? Johnny wondered about the petulant tone in Steve's voice. He couldn't let it derail the purpose of his visit, though he plowed full steam ahead. I thought I'd have to bring my magic cloth back for another try, he said, smiling as if it were a joke. You should know that Paul's pretty put out with you about that, Steve said. No wonder he acted 
No wonder he didn't act very happy to see me just now. Steve's pen strayed, stayed active. He told me he was going to mop you in the Poweth. You should probably steer clear of him. Johnny nodded. Gotcha. And I don't want him to pop me in the mouth either. So, no more magic cloth. Steve said, we didn't say anything to Dad about it. Something like that would have bothered him too. Well, there was his answer. The cloth had not made an encore appearance. Steve finally looked up. Why are you here? The question took Johnny to Johnny by surprise. What do you mean? I came to see how you were doing. Steve put his pen down. I thought maybe you came to apologize to my dad. Apologize? For what? You tell me, Steve said. If you mean for exposing a, his still, I don't have any reason to apologize. It was illegal. I know the money helped, but no, I don't mean that. Dad admitted that he shouldn't have done it. Then what? I don't know, but something's going on. He gets a weird look in his face whenever I mention you. Beats me, Johnny Force, a bit more cheerier into his voice. Anyway, I'm glad you're feeling better. Steve looked directly. Steve slowly directed his hands upward and scratched his nose. The effort appeared difficult. Johnny wondered whether Steve was actually getting weaker instead of better. So, are you serious about helping sell my cards? Steve asked. Steve, sure, we're friends, and friends help each other. As soon as they're ready, let me know. Steve chuckled. Thanks. If you sell all of them, Paul might warm back up to you. He does love a good grudge, but he loves not having to work even more. I'll give it the old college try, Johnny declared. Steve's grin grew bigger. Then I'll be sure to. T then I'll be sure my dad prints lots of them. Johnny smirked and stood up to leave. Steve said, You aren't leaving already, are you? You just got here. I was going to offer to play Don't Chip the Tooth. It's a hoot. Never heard of it. You see the jar of gumballs on my dresser? Those are the game pieces. You lie on the floor and try bouncing gumballs off the table and into your mouth. But you can't move. You mean I just lie flat on the floor with my mouth open and trust you'll be bouncing them in? Who said you weren't bright? Who said you weren't bright? Steve chided. I do it with Paul a lot, and only chipped his tooth once. And I get to keep the gumballs? Well, I don't want them back. Though we could leave them for Paul. It'd serve him right for being such a wet blanket. The boys played for hours, laughing and being silly. Johnny couldn't remember the last time he had so much fun. He didn't think about... Fiona's accident or missing the missing cloth once the entire time. Chapter 7 Johnny left 
Steve's house in a fluster. He had such a good time that day had sped by. It was already dark when he turned on to Brewster Lane. It was one of the few roads with street lamps on it, so it was easier t to see as he trudged along the sidewalk through the icy layers of snow. People called streets the with lights the white way. And it was never truer than this night. With the round of fat snowflakes falling, scents of ash and birch smoke wafted from the neighborhood chimneys. It was an uncommon quiet outside. With few people stirring, most huddled inside, playing family games, listening to the Lux Radio Theater broadcast, or if they were kids, wasting the perfectly good night wake, wake, taking their weekly bath. Johnny walked past the grand, o the old Granville house already. That place had been the hub of several adventures for him. He still had strong memories of his and Emmy's confrontation with Wilson Knox's greedy uncle in the clump of trees on the ground called the Lover's Circle and the coffin and, fi and of finding the coffin lying in the crawl space underneath the main room of the house when Steve, Paul, and Emmy had broken through the floorboards, not to mention Ben lying on the ground in the property behind the place after he'd been shot by his own father. I have to admit, he thought, life in Providence was, has been anything but boring. Whack! A snowball clocked Johnny square in the back of the head. He heard a familiar laugh. What a shot! It was Wilson Knox. Johnny hated being surprised like that. And it was all he could do to keep from smacking Knox upside the head with something harder than a snowball. You didn't see that one coming, Wilson teased as he walked up. A thought popped into Johnny's head. Sore about me taking the role of Scrooge from you? He smirked. Bullseye. He had struck a nerve. Wilson's smile faded and was replaced with a scowl. Johnny was turning to go when Wilson said, What were you doing? What were you doing at the water tower yesterday? Digging for gold? Johnny stopped in his tracks. I was looking for something from my experiments. What's it to you? I bet you didn't find them. Johnny wheeled around. You took them? He bellowed. Whoa, hold your horses, Kimosabi. How would you know I didn't find them unless you took them? Johnny roared. Wilson's smile returned. I'm just giving you a hard time. Ease up. I don't even have a clue what was out there. My car battery and some rags and stuff. You and your dumb experiments. Tell me the truth, Knox. Did you take it? Johnny yelled, a little more forcefully than he intended. Ha! Huh. Who would give a hoot about that junk? Wilson added, except maybe an egghead like you. It's actually a fair point, Johnny thought. Who would give a hoot? I might help you look for it, Wilson continued, in return for a little favor.
Wilson's help was about as welcome as Johnny as a to Johnny as a dose of castor oil. With his best sarcastic tone, he said, You want to be Scrooge? Wilson considered it. Well, forget it. Johnny turned to go. Then, then put in a good word with Emmy for me, Wilson added. Johnny's turned his turn to face Emmy. Turn to face William. Emmy? So all that brave defender stuff with Laszlo the other day. Was that? Was that? Post posturing to get her attention? Then it dawned on him. You put Laszlo up to it, didn't you? Johnny scoffed. Hard to believe, coming from a guy who is one. Emmy's not gonna fall for some schmaltzy gestures, you know.